Yeah, so so I've been listening uh, for all these years. I think I was probably listening the very first time you suggested your very first napkin math uh, idea. And I was very taken with it. I like simplicity. I like to, I like to be able to come up with a, a simple a metric. Um, and this metric worked for me. It, and I, I listened to it carefully and then you uh, modified it and you came up with other napkin math and all of them appealed to me. So having said that, in the, I think I early on. Having, having said that is when the slap is about to come. <laughs> I think early on, I actually sent you an email or a text or something I, very early on. And I said, no, no, there's some real problems here. And the real problems start with what we call big number theory or big number analysis. Big number analysis says um, the Japanese were going to take over America. Uh, 25 years ago. Everybody was so worried that they had brought up all the oceanfront property in Hawaii and they bought up all the golf courses and boy, next was going to be the tall buildings and who knew, you know, the, the Japanese would own it all. It was just a matter of time. Well, guess what? Big number, big number theory caught up with the Japanese and nobody's talking about the Japanese taking over America. Anymore. Wait, wait, wait. But what's big number? I mean, here's the reality. The, the golf courses ended up losing money. Yes. I mean, golf, golf in general has sort of declined as a, as a business in the United States. Um, and the Japanese already owned a lot of Hawaii because the population of Japan of Hawaii is about 40 percent Japanese American. So what's the big deal there? Where, where's the big what is big number theory and what does that have to do with it? So big number theory in their particular case meant there's only so many Japanese and there's only so much uh, GDP that they can create, only so much wealth that they can create. And they have to decide where that wealth is going to be spent. Is it going to be spent at home? Is it going to be spent abroad? Is it going to be spent on hotels? Is it going to be spent on golf courses? What? It, so there's a there's a limit. There's an upper limit on any kind of enterprise like that that you can come up with. And so my first concern from the very first time you mentioned it was big numbers break down at some point. Now. You can't just, as you just pointed out, you can't just throw that out and say, oh, it's big numbers, therefore it won't work. So let me start with the very most important big number. And now we'll bring in one of my other guy I'm just a huge fan of. And anybody that listens to you that's not also watching Tony Siba and anything that Tony Siba says, and also Kathy Wood is making a huge mistake because those two are kind of like the scientists that are underpinning what we lawyers and us glib actors on, on, on are producing in our books and our YouTube channels. So Tony Seba's done the math and Tony Seba says that the value, that the cost of goods, the cost of goods of batteries will decline another 60% between now and 2030. Kathy Wood agrees with them. I think she's got, she's got, her number is just about the same. So if the cost of goods are going to decline between now and then by 60%, it is almost guaranteed that the resale value is also going to decline by that 60% because the competition will drive it down. Okay, so I think we can agree that the cost of batteries, I mean, even Elon Musk is saying that's their, their goal of Tesla. One of their goals is to reduce battery costs. And not only that, but to improve the battery supply chain, not just for Tesla, but for the world so that the cost of materials going into batteries goes down. But the decline, a, a reduction in the cost of batteries doesn't necessarily translate into a significant reduction in the cost of the products that contain the batteries. And the reason for that is um let's take a tesla model y that has a i'll, I'll just start my model, model 3 or model y that has a 60 kilowatt hour pack those vehicles are selling for say fifty thousand dollars and the battery sells themselves you know let's say they're 60 kilowatt hours on a hundred dollars a kilowatt hour that's only six thousand dollars it's not that big a component of the cost of the car so if you reduce that cost from six thousand dollars to four thousand dollars then maybe you lower the price of the vehicle by two thousand dollars and maybe not but that doesn't have a significant that, that lowers you from eight hundred dollars a kilowatt hour to seven hundred dollars a kilowatt hour in revenue for the product, let's say, and I'm calling it five hundred. So I've already I've already accommodated for that. It matters more with Megapack because I think yeah. uh, you know with Megapack, Megapack is probably using lithium iron phosphate batteries already. That price is going to come down more. Um, but 
then there's the other challenge, which is, yes, I, I think fundamentally your argument gets into the competition is coming. That if the cost it's not, of the, it's not just that the competition is coming, it's that the actual cost of the of the finished product, cost of goods on the floor. Okay, I'm a manufacturer, so I'm always thinking about what is the cost of goods on the floor. I'm always figuring that I want to, if I'm a manufacturer, I typically want to double from the cost of goods to the first sale. Okay. Now that's not always true. If it's a very expensive product like a mega pack, you're not going to double to that uh, that uh, utility that's going to buy it from you. But overall, you you start with your cost of goods sold on the floor, and you have a a marginal effort that you're trying to reach, a marginal level that you're trying to reach in terms of the multiple you're going to put on that when you sell it. Well, if you can get more than that multiple, great. And if you got a lot of moats that can like patents and whatnot that can allow you to charge way more than that multiple, great. But there's going to be a whole bunch of people making batteries and there's going to be plenty, I think, of raw materials by 2028. Okay. So okay, I got to stop you. I, I, I got to stop you. I, 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 don't, I don't dispute that there will be a lot of people making batteries. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that, that Tesla won't have competition for battery production and battery sales. What I'm suggesting is that I'm not talking about Tesla selling battery cells mm -hmm. and making a profit on selling battery cells. I'm talking about Tesla putting battery cells in products right. in cars and mega packs and power walls in particular and bots right. eventually. Yes. Tony Siba also says that the value, that the car cost, the EV cost is also going to come down, I would say roughly by the same amount. And of course, we're all talking about 10 million units of the new Model A or whatever it's going to be called. 10 million units of that, which is going to be half the cost, half the labor, half the footprint in the plant, et cetera, et cetera. So your 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 uh, average cost of sale of a vehicle is going to drop by about probably half by the time we get to that level. Okay, so over, they're not going to be all sold. Some of them are going to be in the fleet. I mean, there's a whole bunch of, 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 of things to discuss there. Some of those actually support your argument. Some of them would support the idea that the average that your napkin math will at least be halved okay so the, the thing is the thing is while i agree that the cost of producing those vehicles will come down mm -hmm. i also believe so i think my expectation for the robo taxi platform and this is a guess more than anything else mm -hmm. is that the cost of production of let's say a model three is let's say forty thousand dollars and they're trying to get the cost of production of the robo taxi model to twenty thousand dollars and they're going to sell the robo taxi platform vehicle for thirty thousand dollars okay and if it's going to have a 50 kilowatt hour battery pack mm -hmm. that's still six hundred dollars a kilowatt hour so you're still seeing a substantial revenue the the the, the, the revenue per kilowatt hour is still more than five hundred dollars a kilowatt hour so oh, I, and, and right. i think and i think the thing is that i so i i, I watched tony seba a little i just read a great thread he did on um plant-based food which is mm -hmm. coming the revolution mm -hmm. in, in, in meat basically right. mm -hmm. in animal agriculture and or the destruction of animal agriculture really and replacement with something much healthier for society and, and, and environment but um the what what the argument you described ignores the demand side and and the reality is that the demand is there for electric vehicles the demand is there for battery storage and all that and as long as the demand is there the question isn't is the cost of producing this stuff going down the question is is the volume of production enough to meet the demand and and the thing is if if i'm correct and the demand for electric vehicles and the demand for battery storage is much larger than what tesla will be able to produce until sometime after 2030 then even if they're able to make more and they're able to make them cheaper, the demand is so high that that will keep the price up. And then the second point, which I'm going to skip over the Tesla keeps the vehicles in its own fleet and puts them in the robo taxi network, which right. is the robo taxi model, right? Yeah. Um, the, the, the battery revenue model assumes the robo taxi fleet never happens, right? But you could have FSD get better. You could have right. FSD get to the point where more people decide to buy it. You could get FS, F, FSD get better to the point where people are willing to pay more for it. And if all you do is, you're charging, let's say, twenty thousand dollars for FSD instead of today's fifteen thousand, mm -hmm. and you go from ten percent of buyers buying it to twenty percent of buyers buying it. That's an add-on to the revenue per kilowatt hour if you look at it in that context. Right. So agreed. agreed. There's a again. There's a whole bunch of reasons why you could be 
under under uh, your number. Like for instance, that most of the fleet, that most of the cars remain in Tesla's fleet because then the revenue per car, per kilowatt hour is going to go up dramatically. Click the link below to get your paperback, Kindle or audiobook now.